Welcome into the Hoffman Show. That's a podcast where we go a little bit deeper than we can on the radio. And my guest today is someone who's been lucky enough to have on the radio quite a bit over the last few months as the Commanders and Nationals have been for sale. It's Eben Novi Williams, who writes for Sportico, reporter there. And Eben, I appreciate your time, man. I'm excited to go deeper on this. Thanks for having me, Craig. Yeah, this is I've enjoyed our conversations on the radio and looking forward to go uh, going a little deeper now. So uh, how, what, would, what is it that you consider you do? Because there's like, you know, there's lots of sports business reporters that cover whether it's sports media. Obviously, you we've talked a lot about like the team sales side of things, but there's so many different aspects of sports media. What is it that you consider you do? Yeah, I like to think that Sportico, anything that is a big dollar figure behind sports is are things that we care about. So that's media deals, as you mentioned. That's in some ways player salaries. It's sponsorship. It's marketing. It's betting. It's all those things. But the holy grail, the biggest deals in our industry are the billion-dollar deals, and those are the team sales. So no question. Those are the ones that, that, that get us most excited, and, and it's a great time right now to be covering – Billion dollar team sales. Uh, there have been a few in the past few months. There, there's a number of other franchises in the market. A couple of them in the DC area. Uh, this is the this is kind of an all time moment right now for team sales. So us at Sportico, we're we're very excited about the last few months and what what's coming up in the next few months uh, because these are the things we're, we're nerds about the the business side of things, but especially the team sales because I do think it's a fascinating world and the way valuations are growing right now, the types of people other industries that are, that are flocking towards sports ownership. Uh, it, it is clear to me that sports is kind of the nexus right now of entertainment in the U.S. So it is. And by the way, also not just the U.S. around the world. We see obviously a lot so of true. Uh, people getting involved, you know, sovereign wealth funds, buying European soccer clubs, et cetera. Uh, I don't know. We'll see, how, we'll see how we're going on time wise. If I want to explore my, my <laughs> soccer stuff today, if we have time, uh, if not, uh, we can do it. We can do it another time. But um, like it is a cool world. So how do you get into it? Because like, I think there's a lot of people that be like, I want to cover rich dudes buying sports teams. <laughs> Maybe even some rich ladies will start buying sports teams soon. Soon. We can only hope. Um, how do, how do you, how do you get into this world? You it's, like, you have a business background. Like what, what, how do you get into this? I kind of stumbled into it. It's funny. I was, I knew I wanted to get into journalism in college and I had an idea that, that writing about sports was what I wanted to do. And in my mind, it was just, I, I'm going to go be a beat writer for a college or a professional team somewhere. And I was applying to jobs uh, when I was a senior in college all around the country and really struggling to find work. It's just not, newspaper is not a great industry to, to break into. And in, in the middle of my struggling around, I ended up getting a meeting with, with a, a fairly high ranking editor at Bloomberg. Uh, had a good meeting. He eventually offered me an internship. I got an internship at Bloomberg. And Bloomberg, as, as you know, really only covers the business side. So I ended up in the sports division at Bloomberg where they were writing largely about the, the business side of sports. Uh, and I knew uh, not nothing about business, but I knew pretty much nothing about business. There, there's a – you'll laugh at this. There's a, a quiz that every Bloomberg intern takes when they when they come to Bloomberg that is essentially like a very basic breakdown of like what what's happening in the business world right then. Questions like what is Berkshire Hathaway? I had no idea what Berkshire Hathaway was. There was a question about roughly how much is Amazon stock? Is it like $0.10, cents, $10, or $100? I thought it was $0.10. Cents. I just didn't even understand like the way stocks were priced in the U.S. I did wow. historically bad on that intern test. But uh, <laughs> thankfully, they saw something in me. I stuck around as an intern for a long time, more than a year. Uh, eventually got a full-time offer. And I was at Bloomberg for about a decade. Um, and, uh, two and a half years ago, my colleague Scott Soschnick and I worked together at Bloomberg for, for that full time left and started Sportico. Scott is the editor in chief. I was one of the first people he hired and we've kind of hit the ground running from there. So it's not a world. I certainly didn't, I don't have an economic background. I didn't, I didn't leave college thinking, oh, I want to write about sports, but I will tell you, I, I go to sporting events fairly often. And I'm in the press box and the, the beat reporters are there writing about what's happening in the game. And in an exciting game, I watch them delete everything they have and rewrite the story as fast as possible. And I am very glad that I am not uh, kind of at the mercy of what's happening on the field. I, I really enjoy diving into what's happening on the business side, caring more about the, the people who own the teams or the people who run the teams than the, than the athletes who are on the field. All of it I really enjoy, and, and, and I'm really glad that whatever the sliding doors moment would have been when I was applying for jobs uh, 12 years ago, I'm really glad it ended up the way it did. 
That's really cool. So you went from knowing nothing about business to running one, uh, which is always <laughs> always fun. I, I'd like to I'm, think I know a little more now, but, <laughs> but yeah. maybe I don't. Well, I, I say, someone who has like a side business, I still know nothing. So if you got any quick pointers, uh, let me know on how that's going. Yeah, it's interesting. Media <laughs> feels like a really good place to cut your teeth in this world, right? Like it's a, it's a world, as you know, that is changing so drastically. Mm-hmm. And uh, someone like you or I can be in a position where we're kind of responsible for those things, right? And that's uh, it's scary in some ways, but it also is a it's a great educational process not to not to like i mean i guess we can it's a podcast uh, but like not <laughs> to completely side rail the conversation it's actually something i talk about a lot with when i go to speak to journalism classes um, which i do often enough i guess is something that you do when you're in this business you wind up going back and talking to younger younger folks and it's like well what what makes you different than the person on the couch like why is it that you actually like yeah the journalism degree and the tenets of journalism you will learn in this class whatever other classes are things that will help you be good at the job but you also need to actually know your subject matter and so if you're going to cover sports i think you have a responsibility to learn about some of the x's and o's or the business side or like you should have some elevated expertise somewhere and it's, you don't have to be born with it um nobody's born with anything uh, at least in terms of knowledge, but you should, you have a responsibility to learn it along the way so that you actually know what you're talking about. Because part of journalism is, is to not be someone who just regurgitates information. Like your job is to find things out, know what questions to ask and be able to fact check those things so, so that you ultimately report the truth, whatever the truth is about a given topic. And unless you have a knowledge base, you can't actually do that. I think that's right. That's definitely right. And it, it, it is a, a really fun job and industry to be in. If you're intellectually curious, it's, it's maybe not the best industry to be in if you want to get paid, paid a lot of money, but no, I, uh, no. I, I fact, definitely I, enjoy I think the, some the of the highest paid people in our it. business are not intellectually curious and that's yeah. why they're the highest paid. <laughs> they just say what they say their thing and then they get to be hot take artists who get paid. All exactly. The money and they look good and comfortable on television. Yeah, exactly. What are we doing? What are we doing? And we're, I ask myself and, every day, Craig. And here, here we are. We're the ones talking about business. Oh God! All right. So you got that's how you got into it. Um, ultimately, when you, when you look at a team like the Commanders that is for sale, right? If if I'm, which we've just established, I'm very much not a rich guy looking to buy a team. I'm, I'm neither. Um, actually, I would buy a team. That's that's a different story. I'm not the rich guy. So there goes my dream. And you want to get involved in buying a professional football team, buying a professional soccer team, buying a professional baseball team, basketball team. What is like, how does this process work? Let's start off with from the buyer side of it. And then obviously, or actually, no, let's start with the seller side. Cause it's gotta be for sale first. That would make more, more sense. Yeah. How does, how does it go from the seller side? Like what have the Snyder family been going through specific to the sale? It, it, a lot of it kind of depends on, on what, what type of sale you want to run, how much of the team you want to sell. And a lot of that is still very much up in the question w- with Dan. But the basic the basic process is, let's say you're an owner, you own all of an uh, NFL team in D.C., you want to sell it. You most almost everyone works for the bank. It, it, it's rare. It still happens sometimes that they don't. But you hire someone to help run that sale process. And what they do is they essentially hang a shingle about this team's for sale reach out to us if you're interested. They do an early round of vetting to try to figure out how many people are interested, who those people are, what the league and every league has its own structure and rigor around what it's going to take to approve people, et cetera. They get a sense of, of how many bidders, bid groups are interested. They run a basic process on initial bidding. In that process, they give a select amount of information about the uh, finances of the team. Right. If you're going to buy the commanders, you really want to know how many season ticket holders there are, what the sponsorship revenue is, what's coming up for sale, what the it's less true in the NFL. But what's the local media deal like? Right. The, the Nationals, it's the biggest question going going into that sale. Yeah. Oh my there's God, there's, there's so nice. much little things. You get a sense of the business. You get a peek. They call it the data room. You get inside the data room. And then at some point you, you get a sense of where the numbers are. What does the seller want? Does he does he or she want the, the biggest number? Do they care about uh, uh, whoever's going to steward the team in the right direction? Sometimes sellers really do. Other times sellers don't, don't really care once they're out who, who the next owner is and what, what their what their ownership looks like. But it's, it's, it's weighing the priorities of the seller in terms of finances and some other things and also getting a sense of how many bidders are real. And then either you do a kind of a standard auction where you're – Letting the bidders play against each other sometimes, and, and this is becoming more common, you end up with doing best and final offer. So you tell, let's say there's three groups left. 
May 1st, I want your final biggest offer, and we're just going to make a decision from those three to kind of keep the the back and forth from happening. Uh, but it's a really long process. And, and again, a lot of it kind of dovetails both with the seller's interest and, and, and also what the buyer's, what their interest is, et cetera. So for the commanders, they hired Bank of America Securities. Uh, that was kind of the initial thing. And they were looking to explore whether it's a partial sale, full sale, it seems like the winds are blowing towards a full sale um, from every bit of reporting that I've heard. Um, you know, obviously publicly, uh, that seems to be where the, where the winds are blowing because it, it just seems like it's hard. They're going to be hard pressed to find minority investors. Um, where, like, who would want to who wouldn't want to pay Dan Snyder a bunch of money to work under Dan Snyder? Now, I know there's some more complicated things that we can get into where someone yeah. could potentially start as a minority owner with the option to buy him out, um, but. They hire Bank of America Securities to run that process. There was some uh, state of bidding that was due on December 23rd. Where are we right now with the sale, both on like the which direction it's heading and kind of in the process? Yeah, late at the end of December, there was there was some form of early bids or interest due. From what I understand, that was not a final thing. And I, I do believe there, there's a number of people who are looking at the commanders and are still either waiting in the wings or, or, or still trying to suss what Dan's intentions are. I, the, the most interesting thing about the commander sale to me is that there is an obvious, really deep pocketed buyer out there. in Jeff Bezos, who has expressed interest in, in wanting to own an NFL team, he would be unless Elon Musk also wants the team, the richest person in, in, in the auction. And that scares a lot of other parties when they're interested in buying the team. And I'll, I'll give you a, a good example of it. When Steve Cohen was 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 interested in buying the Mets and, and he did a dance with the Wilpons, there was a deal, it fell apart, he was out. A lot of the other groups who were interested in the buying the Mets were like, look, I, I don't have Steve Cohen's money and I don't care about the Mets the way Steve Cohen does. So if Steve Cohen wants to buy the Mets, I'm not going to waste my time. And right. buy side bankers, for example, who only get paid if a transaction happens, they're all like, look, if, if Steve Cohen wants to buy the Mets, he's going to buy the Mets. And I'm not also going to waste my own time trying to get my guy into the room just to find out that Steve Cohen's going to outbid him by $500 million and, and everyone walks their own way. Um, and, and that's happening to a degree. When the Broncos were sold, Rob Walton's name, it took a while for his name to come out. And I think one of the reasons there is that everyone around the sale process understood that as soon as a Walton was involved here, a lot of the other bid groups were going to be like, oh, I'm not going to get into a bidding war with the 11th richest man in the world. Um, I'm going to lose that. So there was a value for people on the sell side in, in Denver to, to get Rob Walton's name out of the press as much as possible, but, but because it made it, more people were interested knowing that w before they knew he was there. And I think that's, what's going on a bit with the commanders. It's like, if Jeff Bezos wants to pay seven and a half billion dollars for the commanders, Jeff Bezos is going to be the next owner of the commanders. I, unless Dan has some, really vitriolic feelings towards Jeff. I don't believe that he does. But outside of that, Jeff Bezos is, is just so rich that it, it's not worth anybody else's time really to bid against him. So I think in, in a lot of ways, that, and I get this question a lot, and I don't, I don't know the answer to be clear, but a lot of people are asking, is Jeff interested? And if Jeff is interested, this could be a very easy, tidy process because not only is he likely to be the biggest bidder, but a lot of people are just not going to want to go through the process to bid against him. Um, so I think that's one of the interesting dynamics we're seeing uh, with the commanders. The other big one, and I also don't know the answer to this, is exactly what Dan's intentions are, right? I, I had heard... Uh, maybe a year ago, a little bit less that he had been talking to people at the NFL about trying to sell minority stakes. I agree with you a hundred percent. I, that is a tough sell given the yeah. way that, 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 that Dan's reputation and also the way his relationship with the last group of limited partners fell apart, uh, both publicly and, and legally. Um, I, I don't think there's a whole list of people, uh, interested in, in being a minority partner under Dan Snyder. I do think that changes a little bit. As you said, if I, if I'm an LP for five years, but you're telling me that in five years I have a right to buy the whole thing, that I think is something that is interesting to some people who would be willing to maybe stomach the whatever the drawbacks is of being a minority partner under Dan for a little bit, knowing that at some point soon in writing they have an opportunity to become the top dog. Um, but I do think there's still a little bit of confusion. And, and the truth may be that Dan doesn't really know either. There's another report coming out about uh, workplace culture around the commanders, and that could have new information that could be renewed pressure from other NFL owners who have been, 
I would say, fairly lukewarm so far and wanting to push him out the door. Uh, so I think there's some uncertainty about what the, the what other owners are going to do. There's uncertainty around maybe what Dan wants to do. And then there's uncertainty around it, whether or not Jeff Bezos is interested. And all those things kind of combine right now to be a very interesting and bizarre sale process, one that is a, a lot less cut and dry than maybe ones we've seen in, in other sports in the past few years. Right. Most people sell because they just, they don't want to get out. They see that how much money these teams are going for. And they are like, I would like that money instead of doing the team, whatever, how much, like what, what is kind of the latest, as far as you've been able to tell on Dan's ability to stay in the league? Like, obviously we're all waiting for the Mary Jo White investigation and it almost seems not at almost, I mean, Goodell almost said it. He's like, well, we'll revisit it at the time. If Dan's no longer the owner of the team. And it's like, Oh, so if he sells, you guys get to keep all your secrets. Cool, 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 cool. That's really the accountability that we're we're hoping for, the transparency that we're hoping for. So if that, you know, we, we'll see what that Mary Jo White investigation uh, shows if we ever get to see it. But is there, like, Dan might need to be out of the league. How does that change the sale, the timeline, the everything? If whether Roger Goodell is like, Dan, I've seen the report. You need to sell now. Or Dan calls everybody's bluff and the report comes out and it's as bad as we all think it's going to be. Yeah, it, it, I think it's my, my sense from talking to people in and around NFL ownership is that owners want Dan out. Uh, and if they could all press a button and know there were no consequences for any of them and that he would go quietly, almost all of them would hit the button immediately. The truth is that they don't live in that world, right? And And I know there are people in and around the NFL who are fearful of setting some sort of a precedent around Dan that could then come for them at some point. If former employees or more information comes out about their own organizations, I, I, there was that ESPN story about Dan collecting information about incriminating right. information around other owners. I, I don't know if anyone feels any pressure around that or even how much of that is true, but, but it's, it is clear that NFL owners would like him out, but they are very wary of, both the precedent that it sets and also what, what may happen on the way out. And I think I'm sure Roger Goodell feels this way. I think a lot of owners do. They, they just kind of want Dan to come to this conclusion on his own. It, it makes things significantly easier to not have to go kind of the, the Donald Sterling route, just to use an example. Um, and, and maybe, again, maybe Dan has already reached that conclusion. Maybe hiring Bank of America was the start of that. Uh, or maybe it was just an attempt to, to see if he could raise some money from minority partners and, and put some cash in his pocket for a, a stadium uh, development or to pay off some debt or whatever it is. Who knows? But I, I think the NFL is, they obviously could do more. They, they've been unwilling so far to do it. The Mary Jo White report, in my opinion, is the last chance, really. the the I, I feel, and you may feel the same way, every time we get more information about the commanders and, and, and what's going on in that organization by, by high-ranking members over the past two decades, I, I just feel like this deja vu. I'm like, I can't even remember if it's new information or have I read right. this before? I, I just know, I, I know things were really bad and I hear new anecdotes and I, I, I literally can't remember if I've read this thing before or if this is a new thing and I should have new outrage over it. Um, but there has been uh, a, a, a plethora of information, certainly enough uh, enough information out there about the commanders in the past two decades for NFL owners, if they really wanted to, to push for him to sell. And they have not, at least publicly, really, they have not done that, or really even privately, from my understanding, they haven't done that. So in, in my mind, I think that ship has really sailed for the NFL, but there there may be one last chance to do that. But I do think the general feeling is everybody is kind of hoping that Dan comes to this conclusion on his own, that it's untenable. Right. He can get a huge payday, a really, really big payout if he sells the commanders right now. And that maybe that's enough for him to kind of wash his hands and walk away. So I agree with you on that front. Um, the Mary Jo White investigation has two things going for it. One, it's pro it's been promised by Goodell that there will be a written report, right? The the Wilkinson yeah. report was, but then again, there was a promise. They no one likes to, you know, <laughs> at the NFL, it's like we didn't promise. It's like yeah, you did. There was supposed to be a written report, and you guys just didn't freaking do it because you're the worst. Um, but Mary Jo White report is supposed to have a written report, which will have obviously a lot more detail than the Wilkinson report, which I would remind people all the time was like 
they didn't lay out the crimes, but the punishment was as much punishment as basically they were allowed to do by their bylaws. Like it did not feel like enough because what was done was so bad, but they couldn't find him more than $10 million. They mm-hmm. couldn't do, I mean, I guess they could have suspended him more concretely, but like they, they actually were telling us that really bad stuff happened. They just refused to tell us the really bad stuff, which was a uh, really unfortunate, <laughs> you know, just BS job by them. Mary Jo White report, not going to have that. The other big thing in the Mary Jo White report is that could incriminate Dan personally. Um, Included in the Mary Jo White uh, report is investigations of Tiffany Johnson's allegations, uh, which were made at the Congressional Roundtable, and the 2009 alleged sexual assault on his plane. And if he is personally incriminated, as opposed to... You know, everyone underneath him incriminated and thus like, hey, man, could you not hire the worst people on on the planet and let them create this culture that happened and all these bad things? I think that could be the kind of thing where owners are more likely to push him out because they are less scared about. Well, certainly some are scared of things that could come out in their own personal past. It's a lot higher bar than and frankly, a pretty acceptable bar compared to like, oh, former employee said this and now I'm getting blamed for it. Yeah, I think that's all. I think that's all right. So, so it, it could very well be that in whatever it is, a couple of months, a couple, a couple of weeks, whenever that report comes out, that there is a, a, enough in there, new or enough in there, as you said, kind of directly tied to to Dan specifically, that this becomes either an, an easy decision for owners or one that the public kind of forces on them. Yeah. Um, all right. So that is where that stands as of right now. Um, terms of timeline we've heard potentially you know with with whatever round of bidding happened in december um the earliest this could happen is the owners meetings in march what are the chances you're about to either make me really excited or just completely burst my bubble <laughs> what what are the chances this is done by the end of march at these owners meetings I, I, at this point i think it's fairly unlikely uh again okay. going back to the bezos there goes thing the bubble. If, Be- if bezos wants to pay seven and a half billion and and, and dan right. wants to sell the team that that could happen extremely quickly um it, that that is not a jeff is not difficult to approve for nfl owners it's not difficult for jeff to have the cash ready to make that transaction that is a very tidy process um but if it if, if for whatever reason that doesn't materialize i think it's going to be very hard to, to get a deal done that quickly leagues typically like sales to happen in the off season it just makes things a bit easier but very often and I was down at NWSL draft earlier this week and Jessica Berman, the commissioner of the NWSL, was talking about a number of teams that are for sale in her league. I think they wanted to get those a lot of those sales done before the season starts in, in a month or two, and I don't think it's going to happen. So leagues like to have a, a very tidy process in that regard, but it, oftentimes it takes it takes a lot longer, and we're going to see. I mean, the, the Nationals, for example, been on the market for a lot longer than the commanders have formally. Uh, and then the opposite of that, the Suns process took yeah. four months less maybe even so uh the, the chelsea sale was five weeks uh last year so, so there are there are exceptions sometimes these do happen very quickly but i would be very surprised if if it was not jeff bezos if there was a, a firm set new owner of the commanders by by the end of march uh, of course, the tie that binds the Sun sale, the Chelsea sale, and the Commander sale together is there was there was real purpose in getting the current owner out. Yeah, um, Sarver uh, Roman Abramovich uh, over in England slash because of his ties. Uh, to Russia and being a Russian oligarch. Uh, th- those are his ties. He was a Russian oligarch uh, and Russia invaded Ukraine. And so they're like, get out. And and Todd Bowley was like, I will pay whatever you want. <laughs> um, and then obviously Sarver and Snyder uh, here in the US, people are aware of that. So for the current commanders, this might be the, 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 the question that a lot of fans actually care the most about um, of my day-to-day radio audience, let's say. How does this affect the team and the football operation right now from their ability to sign players to contracts like, you know, Deron Payne, their star defensive tackle is do a big deal. If he wants a lot of guaranteed money up front, is Dan Snyder going to be willing to pay a lot of guaranteed money uh, and put that money in escrow and be like, well, I guess I guess Deron gets his cash. And I, you know, even though I won't be here to see him play out most of his contract. Uh, obviously we've seen Ron Rivera is not going anywhere. And I think in other ownership situations, this, this three season run could have gotten a head coach easily fired. So how does this affect their, their ability to do business 
as if a, an owner was in place for the long term? Yeah, it's a really it's a really good question. I, if there are people who work within the commander's organization that don't particularly like Dan, I'm sure there's some excitement about the possibility of having uh, having a different boss on the player side of things i find this question to be so fascinating because i'm constantly amazed at teams that are on the market that in the process of their sale process end up doing huge team altering transactions the nationals mm -hmm. made a decision on juan soto when the team was for sale and right before rob walton bought the broncos the team traded uh, Russell Wilson in a, in a massive deal, right? The team traded for Russell Wilson in a massive deal that that gave away a lot of future draft capital, the kind of things that a lot of owners like to have when they buy a team, right? I could put my stamp on this team right now and immediately. Um, the, Real the quick, Angels did, did the, for Walton, sale. the Walton family like approve the Wilson deal? Like no, the, that the, happened underneath. It was them. way before. Yeah, it was it was months and months before that deal was even close to being done. Um, and that amazes me, right? That like you, you know that the, the previous Broncos ownership knew that they were not going to be the ones that either benefited from or dealt with the the problems of Russell Wilson being great or being horrible. Yeah. Uh, but they made the deal anyway. And the Angels, another good example, right? They have a they have a Shohei Otani uh, decision to make a, a little while ago, and, and the team was for sale, and, and they made it. So very often, uh, and I'm always shocked by this, but very often teams will not only just continue to to obviously operate but but we'll make big decisions about players uh knowing full well that that a different ownership was going to have to deal with the benefits or the drawbacks of whatever those decisions were so i i wouldn't expect dan to be all that different than he normally would be in the next few months um but I, Dan is also kind of a wild card in some ways, so yeah. I, I don't know. I, I certainly will, I won't speak for him. But but it, 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 in general, I am always really interested about how the like lame duck ownership decision making and how very often you see some really big choices that get made by by, by owners who are on their way out. Right. Well, and the thought, of course, just kind of goes beyond that with this team because of the the layout of upper management. Like mm -hmm. Ron Rivera being the primary decision maker, there's not a team president who is also looking out for the long term of the franchise who could imagine himself potentially being there in a new ownership. The coach and the team, for all intents and purposes, the president of football operations are the same person. Yeah. So the coach is trying to save his job and potentially doing things that are short term at the the behest of the long term. Although Ron is also an internal optimist. And I think <laughs> if you ask Ron Rivera, is he the coach of the Washington commanders in five years, he would tell you yes. Mm -hmm. So that in some ways benefits, uh, but also, you know, his ability to do the job, I think would be the, the drawback that most fans would point to and be like, but he's not good at it. The, the NFL is also just because of the, the salary cap, hard cap, hard floor structure. It's mm -hmm. a little bit different than a league like major league baseball, right? Where right. Steve Cohen bought the Mets and, Mets fans all over New York were like, we're going to spend again, right? And the the Wilpons were spending X and Steve Cohen is spending 3X, right? And th there's a lot in, in a sport like baseball or in European soccer, right? This was the, the question around Todd Bowley and Chelsea. A lot around, is this person going to spend a lot more than the last person? Uh, and in the NFL, it's just a little bit trickier, right? There's the, the, the new owner of the commanders is not going to spend player wise all that much more or less than Dan Snyder has been, pay, been been spending just because of the way that that shakes out. It, it, you do see it in a lot of other things, practice facilities. I, I read the other day that, that for the last Broncos game of the year, the, the, the Waltons put in a, a brand new field surface because yes. players were yeah, complaining yeah. about the, the, the turf. That's something that if you don't have one of the richest men in the world owning your team, maybe, maybe your ownership group doesn't do. So there's definitely ancillary benefits to having owners who are more willing to spend money than others. But in a league like the NFL, at least especially from a player standpoint, the, the, the question for new for, for uh, new owners from fans about, is this person going to invest in the players that I want to see? It's a little bit different for the NFL as well. So speaking of uh, practice facilities and such, uh, the commanders, it's like this six or seven billion dollar transaction, but that's just to buy the team. Their practice facility compared to the rest of the NFL stinks. Mm. Okay. Um, it is extremely expensive to buy land in the D.C. area. Uh, they obviously also need a stadium, something they cannot do right now with Dan Snyder's owner because no one wants to play ball with him. The only thing they could do is rebuild on the land they currently own in Landover. Um, so how expensive, like, 
if I'm if I'm Jeff Bezos looking at this, it's not a seven million dollar transaction. It's like a twelve billion dollar transaction. How does that affect the number of people that can bid on this? Forget if they're trying to go toe to toe with Bezos, but just in general, like how many people can truly afford to do this and do the things they need to to get a new stadium, buy the team, and do major renovations or build a completely new practice facility? It, it certainly makes the. It, you're right. It makes the price tag higher. And we're saying that in the context of the NFL, where the price tag is already essentially impossibly high, right? The the Broncos just sold the, to literally one of the richest men in the world. And we're talking about the second richest man in the world potentially being the next person to buy in. I don't know if, if Jeff Bezos buys the commanders, I don't know where you go from there. How do you and the NFL will have to make structural changes to what ownership means to, to, to make it so that you don't need to be a top 10 richest person in the world to buy whatever the next team is that comes up for sale. Another thing I'll say about the, 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 the stadium and practice facility opportunity that makes in a sale process like this, it makes the commanders more valuable because owners love to come in. They, they, they know the real estate play is a big part of team ownership. Look at what Stan Kroenke has done in LA with the Rams and that stadium that has hosted a Super Bowl already and just hosted the college football national championship. Every owner is, is envious of not only Stan's wealth to, to put that together as a $5 billion stadium, but also the uh, ability and the money that he is inevitably going to make off of having one of the nicest stadiums, if not the nicest in Galicia stadiums in the NFL for a really long time. So if the commanders had a brand new stadium, I, I bet you they would probably sell for a little bit less just because ownership doesn't have the ability to, 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 to kind of put their stamp on and also morph the ancillary businesses in the way that they want to. Steve Ballmer, who paid an insane amount at the time, everyone said it was insane for the Clippers a number of years ago, understood that in the first five or six years of his ownership, he was going to get to build a brand new arena. And he's doing it right now. He's having an absolute blast with it. And when that building opens, the Clippers are going to be in way more valuable than they were three years ago. And he is going to have a lot more business strings to pull in terms of opportunities beyond just the games that the Clippers play. So, yeah, I think a lot of people are looking at the commanders and saying they need a new stadium. Um, I'm going to benefit if I own this team from just not being Dan in the eyes yeah. of politicians in the area. And if I can get a deal done in some capacity, some public money, no public money, whatever it looks like, I can then shape the modern kind of hub and spoke model of sports ownership, which is put the team at the middle, own a stadium, have some ancillary real estate, maybe do mixed use development, some retail, some, some housing, hotels, whatever it is, and start to build a, a kind of an entire business franchise around that sports team. And the fact that the that the commanders don't have any of that right now for this class of really rich people is actually a really it, – it, it, it's, it's an advantage to the commanders. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Balmer. Um, David Aldridge, of course, Hall of Famer, uh, used to work for TNT, now writes for The Athletic, was on my show, let's call it a month ago. And he – we were talking about this, and he's like, look, when the Clippers went up for sale, they were trying to get – uh, you know, they're trying to be nice about it, like professional about it. You know, please, Donald Sterling, will you leave? And it was like a billion dollar sale. And then Balmer offered two billion, and they basically looked at Sterling like, "Get out now! Like we are <laughs> kicking you out. Get out of the bleeping way. You're you cannot not sell." He's offering two billion dollars. Um, if Bezos this looks great, by the way, two billion dollars looks like a great deal now. Yeah, people thought I mean, people thought Steve was crazy. I do um, want to ask you in a second, looks, like, why is this good. happening? Yeah. Why? Why are they exploding? But first, just like on the NFL side of this, is there a number where the NFL looks at Dan and if Bezos comes in at seven, eight, whatever it may be, and they go, get out now. It's too much money. And all the other owners are like, if our franchises are worth close to that, you need to leave right now because that precedent needs to be set. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I think the answer is 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 no, not in that kind of cut and dry sense. Because again, I get the sense that that everyone is treading very lightly around Dan right now at the NFL, not trying to be heavy handed, not trying to, to to push him in any direction. I do think that Dan will feel that. I think if again, if if the price is seven and a half, whatever it is, if Jeff Bezos comes with a number that is that big. I think he would be crazy not to get out, right? That is right. A, a double, triple, quadruple generational wealth just right there in, in one transaction. But I, I don't think that the NFL will, will feel like they – just because the number is on the table that is really high, they want to get him out. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that will happen. But again, I, I could be – I could be wrong on that. My, my colleague Scott, who hosts our, co-hosts our podcast, he has this vision of, 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 of Jeff doing it publicly. 
that Jeff comes out and he says, I am telling the world I'm publicly making a seven and a half billion dollar offer to Dan Snyder for the commanders. And I do think that that could put some pressure on Dan a little bit from fans once it's all out in the open. And it's clear that that his refusal to sell if he doesn't take that offer is turning down seven and a half billion dollars. I think people would view that as very petty and there would be a lot of thoughts about that. There, there may be some strategic uh, advantage to Jeff just coming out and very publicly making that uh, making that claim. But I would be surprised if that happens. It's not the way that these things typically operate. But again, a lot of this a lot of this commander's process has been so bizarre that I guess I, I shouldn't be surprised by anything at this point. I'm just imagining and dreading the the Gene Medina statements on that the the lawyers coming out and just ruin more of my oh, days, yeah. <laughs> please on the radio. Um, all right, uh, the Nat sale. I guess the simple question is, what the hell is going on there? Because yeah. it seems like now it's the the latest thing I saw. Uh, I can't remember if it's from you guys or someone else the other day that the learners are now probably just going to keep it. Like, is that, is that what we're leaning towards? It, it wouldn't surprise me at the, at this point, it, it, it felt way closer three months ago than it feels right now. Um, and it, it felt very close with Ted Leonsis from what I understood a, f a few months ago. Um, and typically when, and I don't have too much recent inside information, but typically when there's a, feels like there's a, a strong one candidate and then months go by and nothing gets done. I think that kind of sends the antenna up of, oh, maybe they're they're a bit further apart than it seemed like they were. Um, Ted would make sense, obviously, from a from a regional standpoint to to to, to be the buyer here, but uh, it's a it's a really messy sale, you know, because of and we don't have to get into all the details, but because of the way the local rights and and the lawsuit tied up between the Nationals and and the, and the Orioles, it's fairly messy right now. And I, I think a lot of I know a lot of the prospective buyers came in and, and uh, took a, a deeper look at that. And it's a great market. DC is an awesome market. It's a good baseball market, but it's, uh, I think it's frustrating. And also it's, it's not a great market if you can't capitalize on it financially in the way that, that, that you so want stupid. To. Um, and, and the, the crazy thing, one of the crazy things about this is that the Orioles also kind of on the market, a, a lot of people, bankers, lawyers, investors, they're all kind of thinking that, you know, and there's been a lot of infighting among the Angelos children. A lot of them feel like the Orioles could be for sale either right now or at some point in the, in the near future. It almost makes me wonder if baseball couldn't just like get the two teams together and be like, look, you're both about to sell. Like this lawsuit is a problem probably for both of you, but it's especially true for the nationals. Like, why don't we just figure out some kind of either mega transaction or some agreement across the board that lets new ownership here, new ownership there, let the nationals go their own way with their local rights, whatever it looks like. Uh, it does feel like the fact that both these teams could be for sale is maybe actually an opportunity for baseball to kind of clear up whatever the, uh, the issue is behind them. But I, I, the, the impression I always got about the learners was that they were kind of testing the market. It wasn't as though they felt we have to get rid of this asset. We're, we're definitely going to sell it no matter what. It seemed like a pretty good time to try to sell a baseball team. It probably still is. And if they got a number that they were satisfied with, they were going to do it. And if they found that the market didn't have a number waiting for them that they wanted, that they would be perfectly fine to pull the team off the market and, and maybe try again in a few years if they wanted to. Uh, so yeah, if you told me in a month, the team's no longer on the market, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me but but the longer it goes without a deal getting done especially when it did feel like for a little while things were fairly close i think probably the more skeptical i am of of some kind of big leonsis transaction happening um man i really hope like that would be great if baseball was just like a stipulation of the sale like we will not approve you as a new orioles owner if you do not unleash the nationals take yeah, it's the funny. chain off i was talking to someone the other day who was asking what, what baseball should just buy both teams settle whatever the beef was between them and then put both teams on the, on the market. And I, that is not going to almost definitely not going to happen and, and would be thorny for, for a whole host of reasons. But yeah, it does just feel like there is just by virtue of what is potentially happening at both those clubs, an opportunity to kind of hit the reset button on, on the local TV rights in Baltimore and in, in the DC area in a way that probably does certainly makes the nationals more valuable and, and maybe makes the Orioles more valuable as well. Yeah, that would be very nice. All right, last thing. Um, why are these clubs going for so much money here and around the world? Like, what has happened to rights, uh, team ownership, whatever it is, that has just, I mean, 
sent these things in the stratosphere. I mean, Snyder bought the the Washington team for eight hundred million, and that was a pretty expensive transaction. And that was twenty five years ago. And now he's going to sell it for like seven, maybe eight billion dollars. Yeah, um, we've seen all the you know as as people sell, we've seen you know they bought it in year whatever for this, and now it is selling for that. And some of these aren't that long ago. Um, what is it about the market right now that these the team values are exploding? The, the Suns are the best example of this to me because the, the Suns yeah. raised money at like a one and a half billion dollar valuation less than two years ago, and the valuation on on Matt Ishbia's purchase is four billion dollars, uh, and that's literally like eighteen months separating one another. There, there's a few kind of big macro answers to your question. I, I think part of it is. The way that media has shifted in the past two decades has just made a lot of these sports teams because sports is just such a valuable part of the of the media live media ecosystem has made a lot of these sports teams just infinitely more valuable because of that. the The scarcity aspect is is huge. The fact that there have been three NFL teams that have traded in the past decade, or maybe just two, depending on on, on where you start and stop that clock. Like it's not that common for for teams to come up for sale. And uh, both the NBA and the NFL, and I think the other leagues as well, really feed off that idea that you know, who knows if the commanders sell, who knows when the next NFL team is going to be come up on the market, right? So if if you're not going to buy the commanders, uh, what's the next team that's going to come up? So and there, and then there's a finite number of them, really, right? The NBA is going to expand a little bit, but. There's never going to be probably more than 35 NFL teams ever, right? And there's there's probably not going right. to be that much more than 32 NBA. T- like, there's just not. It's not like we're just creating a lot more of these things. So, uh, I think there's a lot of things. Those those are a, a, a bunch of them. Um, I also think the deal deal structure is is a really interesting part of this. And I was talking to someone about the about the the Suns the other day. Just how crazy the four billion dollar number for the Suns is. But the ownership in sports is a little bit different than how you or I might think about owning like a, a car or a, a or a house, for example, right? The the you don't need to own 100 percent of the team to be the owner. Robert Sarver mm-hmm. owned 35 percent of the Suns, and he got all of the benefits of being the owner of the Suns, even though he was nowhere close to a majority of the Suns' ownership shares. So when when people see four billion dollars with Matt Ishbia, um, he's only buying essentially half the team right now. And I think if, if Matt Ishbia went into this process saying, like, I have $2 billion of cash and I'm going to, I want to I buy the Suns. Uh, I think the truth is maybe he doesn't care that much about whether that's 50%, $4 billion valuation, or that's 66%, $3 billion valuation. Th- those things are not that, all that different um, in, in the sports world. So I, I think that's an interesting part of it as well. Like, if you, if I told you, Craig, you're buying a car and you can buy 100% of the car for this much money, or you can buy 50% of the car. The entire time you have the car, it's your car. You park it in your garage. You drive it wherever you want. It's yours. You can keep it for two years or keep it for 10 years. It's your car. You're paying 50% of it. But whenever you decide to sell the car, you only get 50% of the profits. That's a pretty darn good deal for a lot of people. Right. And I, and I know that that's a, a rough analogy because a car is a depreciating asset and sports teams have not been. Um, but I do think that. Yeah, yeah, but your car focus... is actually going to be worth 18 times what <laughs> exactly. you bought it for exactly. 10 years from now. Exactly. But the, 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 I think we get hung up a lot on like the top line number. Like, what is this team worth? Right. But I, I don't think if, if, if Matt Ishbia had to buy 100% of the Suns right now, I don't think it's a $4 billion valuation. He doesn't have $4 billion, but I don't think it's a $4 billion valuation. So in some ways, the individual deals warrant like a little bit of, of investigation just to see how to put those numbers in context. But you're absolutely right. There, there's you, <laughs> not many investments jump to mind that would be better than buying really a sport, a U.S. sports team in any league in 1980 to 2000 and having it uh, up on the market in, in, in 2023. It's, uh, it, it's massive returns across the board. Yeah, um, which is actually a really good point. I'll end on this thought for the audience. Um, all Dan Snyder wanted to be his entire life was the owner of Washington. And part of the the issue in getting him out is it is a part of his identity. And get it, convincing him that he is no longer going to be that guy is going to be really expensive. And the thing is, well, it's easy for us to sit here and be like, oh, I, how could he possibly turn down $8 billion? You know what Daniel Snyder would do with $8 billion? Buy the Washington Commanders. <laughs> so... Um, is it, is it, that mean it's not happening? Absolutely not. I think there's too much outside pressure, which, you know, for all the reasons that we went over and we'll see when the Mary Jo White investigation comes out, all of that. But it is a thing that for Dan specifically, 
with this team, his childhood team, this is all he's ever wanted, all he's ever wanted to be. And he's obviously squandered it in ways that are borderline unimaginable. Um, but it is something to keep in mind as this process completes that this is an identity play for him as much as it is a financial one. Uh, so that complicates things in a dramatic way. Evan Novi Williams, uh, reporter at Sportico. Does an incredible job. Uh, this was awesome, man. Uh, there's so much more to talk about if we wanted to go like the global route. Um, NWSL expansion is very much on my radar. Someone who used to work for the Washington Spirit and is like very invested in that league. So maybe we'll do some stuff on that in a future uh, radio or podcast episode. Appreciate you very much, sir. And uh, we'll talk down the line. Thanks, Craig. This was fun as always.